track one, just in, in case you didn't get the note, we, there are now three tracks in, in the conference, so different tracks to choose from. I'd like you to uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Dave Williams. He's an IT architect at Bull. Uh, he works in the UK. He's been using Nagio since it was called NetSaint. And it's a, he's a really experienced longtime user, um, so he's got a lot of experience uh, under I guess under his belt, and uh, he's going to talk today about, uh, you know, Nagios in the in the real world, the data center, how to use different add-ons to to come up with a solution that works for for you. So, uh, thank you, Dave. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Uh, first, the good news: someone's turned up, so I'm I'm, I'm impressed by that. Um, next comes the bad news: you'll have worked out that I don't come from these parts, so sometimes I will say words that you may not understand. Shout at me. Let's do that. Um, all good presentations. We'll start with another agenda. I may or may not stick to it, but you've been warned. Introduction, uh, where I come from, why I think I should be talking to you about what I'm talking to you about. Uh, you may disagree, of course. Uh, example implementations. The implementations that uh, started uh, a few years ago in the UK, uh, we did a number of consultancy runs, uh, put a lot of equipment in, put a lot of software in, and came up with some interesting solutions. Um, one of the lessons learned as we'll go through is that you may put this product in for one reason, but it seems to perform a different function that we'll see. Then we'll move on to data center monitoring. Close to my heart, I've just spent two years of my life building a new data center, uh, from design to project management to implementation to migration. Nagios was the chosen tool to monitor that data center in terms of environment. So this is looking at big things. Well, I think big things. One or two megawatts of generator, HV, uh, electricity, conditioning, air conditioning units, um, everything really. So and we'll see what all the tools that I had to stick together in order to make it work uh, and the kind of vision that it came out with. And at the end it says conclusions. I have some, um, got some hints as well. Um, so let's see how we go. Uh, this is what's gloriously described as my ego slide. Uh, this is where I came from. Um, UK based, I'm still living there. Uh, worked on Honeywell mainframes, IBM mainframes uh, at the level of starting, actually started work cutting assembler code. And that's a tough job. Um, and moved up to operating system maintenance, uh, etc. Onto Unix, HP UX, AIX, Solaris. Um, Networking, Case Kit, 3Com, Cisco. I work for Bull. Bull Information Systems. Uh, Bull is a French computer manufacturer. Yes, there is one out there. We still actually make circuit boards and stick them in boxes and put our badge on the outside. Uh, quite often we, we put our badge on the outside of someone else's, but that's another story. And we still make mainframes, believe it or not. Uh, Unix boxes, uh, power-based. Uh, HPC systems high performance computing, so we're talking 4,000, 8,000 processes in a couple of cabs, which has its own issues, but needs to be managed. Um, security products and managed services. In terms of system monitoring, you may notice, by the way, from the pictures that I thought I was going to one St. Paul's and I've come to another, but I started out using HP OpenView. Everybody has to make a mistake. Uh, that was mine. Uh, it was used to do some really strange things. Um, and it was a kind of big learning exercise, simple requirement. In those days, as you can tell, it was a while ago, I uh, had a lot of dialing lines, hundreds of dialing lines for, that users came into a mainframe system on. Uh, some of them didn't work. Trying to find out which one didn't work was a problem. Uh, and rather extreme amounts of butchery, I managed to get OpenView to test overnight to tell me which strokes on which particular phone lines weren't working. Took a lot of effort. Then I was cursed with NetView because I was a IBM SE and I had to use it to monitor stuff in the SNA world. And then my own company, Bull, produced their own product that looked a lot like OpenView, except it was even more complicated and less user-friendly, called OpenMaster. So about that point in time, I had enough. Uh, and started casting around for something better. Uh, and I bumped into uh, NetSync on AIX. My orientation at that time was I was using AIX systems with HP UX, and that's the way I was searching, and I found 
the first port by a guy called Chris Rothchaker from, actually from Alaska, as it turned out. And he made it work. He'd actually got it to compile clean. So I thought, that's a good thing. I'll try that. And so my first view of Nagios was using a mosaic web browser on an enormous X terminal, peaking at NetSaint 6, and thought, that's not bad. Uh, I can do better than that, though. Uh, so I actually took the port, played with the port, and eventually produced an installable file that's knowing, well, pretty public use, published on our freeware site that an ALX user can just say, install an Agios, and it happens. It pops up, goes in, uh, installs all the, all the dependencies, it makes, makes users, makes groups, puts GD on, and the end result is Apache leaps up and, hey, it's there. And that was an Agios. And having spent all this time doing this on my company's dollar, so to speak, um, we then got to the point of, why did I do it? And the answer was, we can sell this. We can't sell the product, obviously, against the nature of the product, and more than I would want to do. But we can sell consultancy services around it. And so we had a push in the UK to see where we could go. First example, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, which is people who uh, take you to court on the side of the government in Scotland. Um, they do these things. They investigate deaths, complaints against the police. They have two IT locations, Glasgow and Edinburgh. This is about 85 miles apart. Uh, they have a Windows server in every court of justice in Scotland. Um, they run the case management service uh, in an Oracle database written and maintained by themselves with a replicated copy at the other location. So, quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, they're already using SolarWinds to look at their network. Um, so there didn't seem to be much reason for using Nagios. But they had a strategy that said that their major reporting systems must run under AOX. Um, so we went to competitive tender. And the nice thing was we had to compete. We had to install Nagios, get it to monitor the systems, pull data, graph things, look at the Oracle databases, uh, and see how well it did it. Well, it did it very well. After two days, we were pulling data from every court in the land. And after three days, not only that, we were pulling meaningful data out of their Oracle systems as well. Um, it kind of became a no contest. The other, the other guys had just about managed to get their stuff to load up under AIX in three days. So what did we get? 60 Windows servers, monitored for the disk utilization, two AIX servers, and these are fairly big boys, and literally they were big. Um, monitor for CPU, Oracle instances, DB space alerts. Um, because of the nature of their, their caseload, shall we say, occasionally <laughs> things would happen very quickly and they'd get a lot of incidents, which used to fill up their systems. Uh, they, they went to the expense of putting a lovely display screen in, uh, and we sent out text alerts to people when things were going wrong which caused no end of trouble, and it's a point I'll come back to later on in the presentation, because people were used to sleeping at night, not being told at 4 o'clock in the morning that their DB spaces were within 3% of filling up, but they'd best do something about it. Uh, it would have helped if the management had told the support people that was going to happen. Um, that was done in 2005, and it's still there. It just works. There's another one of these casing points that once it's installed and it's ticking over, it just works. While it was installed, we put in a few bits and pieces to basically provide a backstop for solar wings. So Nashios also supervises the collection of data from all the switches, routers in their network, uh, produces those lovely graphs, just to try and you know, help them out a bit, because they did, you know, there's no reasonable choice solar SolarWinds, but they did it anyway. Now this is a completely different end of the spectrum and the end of the country, as it happens. Um, this little red bit in the middle, that is Rother, um, between Dover and Portsmouth, I suppose, is the closest you'll get. It's a council. It's a small council. Its responsibility is mainly emptying the rubbish bins, uh, making sure that houses aren't built where they're not supposed to be, and keeping the streets clean. But it still has its problems, it still has its systems, and it's still governed by central government. So they were looking for something to help them see what was going on in their systems that didn't cost them a lot of money. I mean, the, the, constant, the, the focus here is they didn't have much money. 
what did we end up with? 20 odd window servers being monitored and disparate applications. The, the, the marketplace in that kind of local government space is about an application that's completely vertical. So it will do tax collection, it will do social services, it will do refuse collection, but there are three different applications running on three different platforms. It's quite difficult to, to see if they're all glued together and working properly. So the reporting came in handy. Availability, because the central government forced down things called key performance indicators. So you have to say my services are available for 95% of the time, 98% of the time, forever. And as a bonus, we said, OK, we'll monitor your printers. They had a lot of printers. They had one central office, 30-odd little offices around the, count, the whole county. And that gave us the one ex unexpected benefit. Wasn't seen, didn't see this coming at all. Put in a nice little plug-in, searched around, that monitored HP desk jets. And it reported back, effectively, what's on the little LCD screen. You know, on on you know, tray one full or whatever. And of course, it, what it reported back was tone and low, occasionally. Because, because of a central purchasing decision, all the toners for all the printers were held in one central location. Once a day, a little post van went to each office to take internal mail and bring stuff back. Because of this monitoring system, the help desk could put a toner package on for a printer at a remote location before it ran out. Now that doesn't seem like much, but what it did do was cut the number of help desk calls by 50%. Because they just, the user used to ring up and say, it's a, it stopped. And they'd go through diagnosis and say, it's run out of toner. Tomorrow I'll send you one. <laughs> Which wasn't a really good thing. So it cut down the help desk call and really made the end users happy. And that's a totally unexpected result. Okay, Last example, but a bit, bit chunkier, this one. Um, this is a county council, so it's responsible for education in the UK environment. Um, and this is an internet access system for 30,000 pupils. But of course, it's not your average 30,000 pupils, this is it, because, because some of they start at four and go to 16, um, their needs are various, but mainly their needs are not to let them see things they shouldn't see. And so you have to filter everything, everything that moves. And you have to be sure that those filters are running. And you have to be able to make sure that the, the system's provided. So monitoring the email system, the internet access, intrusion detection, AVs running, a number of mail screeners, the web servers, because an internal web server provision is made as well, so that each little pupil, love, bless them, can have their own website. No idea how much trouble that is. Uh, we report on availability. It's a commercial arrangement. The customer is paying for the service to be available in service hours. He's not paying for it to be away for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. He's paying for it to be there. There's a mix of things going on underneath. Uh, the email system, for those who uh, care about these things, was a product called Scalix because it was basically open sourced, um, extremely performant because it's based on the old HP OpenMail product, so we knew it would scale can support every user in HP at that time, could probably support 30,000 school kids. Had a really nice, sophisticated uh, web interface, and it wasn't Microsoft. Uh, the web, web server is just a product called Plask that just loaded loads and loads of virtual uh, Apache type virtual servers. And then of course underneath, we have Cisco, Panda, Radware, NetEnforcer, MyFilter. I couldn't build a bigger, more complicated set of spaghetti and appliances if I tried. I mean, there's Israelis, Americans, South Americans, it's, everybody had supplied some kind of software and hardware appliance into this solution. Service hours were quite simple. Had to be running from 8 in the morning till 9 at night, five days a week, and then Saturdays, 8 in the morning till 1 o'clock. That was it. And in between times, you kept the system up and you backed up the terabyte or so of data that it was kind of spinning on. Fortunately, it didn't start at a terabyte, it only started at 500 gig, but it spun up. What's it look like? Horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, a lot of discrete servers. This is a, effectively is a set of blades, or two sets of blade chassis with blades in, each blade providing a separate function. The idea was that we could 
put more blades in when we needed. My well, we soon ran, ran out of that idea because we filled both chassis pretty quickly with the amount of workload we were supporting. Uh, then we went virtual. The reason for the blades, the reason for the chassis was if we actually torched one of the chassis, these things were clustered, so the other half of the system would continue on the other side without service interruption, because service interruption costs us money. And then a set of equipment that's doing the IDS, that's going out to the internet, uh, a number of firewalls. Some of those servers are running Debian, some are running Red Hat, some are running Windows. Um, some of the appliances, no idea, it just talks to us. And sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's, it's just a, a whole com complex mesh of things and the idea is we've got to provide that service. How's it done? Um, mainly NLPE. Uh, the agents work quite nicely under Debian once you get them to compile. Um, so under Debian and Red Hat, we were just poking things and saying hello. Um, we fired back stuff uh, into NSCA and also used a thing called Event Log under Windows. And there's a, there's a strange and perverted reason for doing this, but it's quite an interesting hint. The provider of the disk subsystem that we used had a Windows-based management tool for it. That's what you do. He was particularly uncooperative about letting that Windows-based system talk in a meaningful way to Nagios. He wanted to sell us another monitoring package. The fact that the manufacturer of this organization, this disk array is called Bull, doesn't help me at all in this area. <laughs> if that was the rule. You had to do so. So in the end, uh, pointed out that in fact the, the system they had on the Windows server actually logged problems into the, into the Windows event logs. So we just stripped them out of there and sent them off as NSCA traps. No problem. So now we know when a disk goes bad in the array, uh, which incidentally is not a problem because there's a hot spare. And then if another one goes bad, it just falls back on the raiding. And then if another one goes bad, I'm unobtainable. That's the way it works. So that's just a kind of explanation of that we were being, well, my own organization painted me into a corner about not being able to do a certain thing, but I could still use Nagios and a plugin to get around that problem. So we've got email with the Scalix, uh, it's on a cluster. We check the cluster state, we check all the processes are running. Uh, we, cluster state's quite amusing because it's watching what's happening on two different servers. Uh, the Plesk web server is the web server available, so we actually built a test website to make sure we could actually fetch pages. Um, Plesk is a bit of a monster in terms of using disk utilization, so it'll suddenly we need to watch its file system utilization. Uh, AV systems, are they there? Are they not? When was the last time they updated their databases? And that's important because the particular systems that we happen to choose, if they've not had their database update overnight, failed or closed, so they shut themselves off and they shut the links off, so no data passed. So it, it's quite interesting. First time it happened was not pretty, as what happened was we reported everything's running because we, the AV server was responding to little chats to us. It just hadn't gone off to the uh, big database and found a new update, so it just wasn't passing traffic. Very embarrassing. Sorted that one. Uh, my filter is a third-party email filter, very sophisticated, but this is the Debian stuff, but there's a lot of it. It runs a few databases, lots of different systems are running. Uh, you need to make sure there's enough around to handle the load. So in order to sort that little email problem out, there's a, we have a little plugin that sends out an email and then sends it to a reflector mailbox out in the big wide world and then waits for it to come back. It's got a serial number embedded in it so that we know if we get out of step, then we can actually check it off and make sure that things, everything's come back, we're not missing stuff. Um, it's a low-level noise type thing, we only do it every 20 minutes, but this is basically confirming to everybody in the world that email is working both inbound and outbound. Web server, just check HTTP. I mean, ask for, ask for something, make sure the content's looking the way we want it. The backups under North Yorks are, and my net backup, a, a product once wonderful under the aegis of uh, Veritas and not so good under Symantec. Um, but you have to make sure the backups are run, there's quite a lot to backup. Uh, and also that you've got enough tapes in the library for the next backup run, kind of handy. And then we do this trick that everybody wants to do. 
what's my business line? What's my business unit for this system? And we have a formal written SLA with the customer that says email, web service. These, these products must be available that constitutes the service. So we glued that together into one dummy host entity and we test that. But we also test that in a cron tab. And we actually run the CGI from a cron tab to test that availability because we test that at seven o'clock in the morning. The service doesn't have to be there till eight. So we tell everybody, overall, there's something not quite right here. Something might be at warning in one particular location, but when you glue them all together, this means our services will not be available. So at seven o'clock in the morning, we forewarn the managers. And there's nothing more exciting than sending 10 managers a text in five past seven in the morning saying, it's all gone to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Gets their attention. So, what else do we use? Nagios Graph, bless it. Many, many a time this product or plugin has saved my backside. In as much as everybody's saying, what went wrong then? Because the customer will ring up the following day and say, it's a bit slow yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> Telling us yesterday would have been nice. But you can then drill back. And then if you see things like, uh, that's a normal load, by the way, going up to nearly 40, you can probably say, mail server was a bit busy. And we'll look into that. Otherwise, you'd be saying, yes, was it really slow? I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> and not being able to do anything about it. So it's a very nice way of saying, oh, thank you, let me look back. I have all the tools necessary to find out what's going on. This is Scalix email system. So this is all the pieces. And the point about this is that we're not just saying the email system is up, I'm saying it's up. It can see the internet, because there being an internal only mail server is okay, but it's not necessarily what you're being paid to provide. We're checking the internal Scalix stuff. And Scalix has got command line interfaces. Basically, it's a set of commands. You run a command, you get a response back from the shell. So we wrap those up uh, and with, to make a plug-in to say, how big are the queues? Are they safe or not? Nice one. At, there's one at the end that's checking LDAP. So you, you, we have a little issue here. Another learning experience. Check LDAP. LDAP is where we validate all the users who come onto the system. Marvelous. Use the standard LDAP. LDAP server is running. This is good. Well, actually, no, it's not. Because it might be running, but it's not serving. There's a big difference between the two. One is you can connect to it and ask it a question, and the other is you connect to it, ask it a question, and it gives you an answer. So you have to sometimes have to think about this. The standard system, yeah, it's great, it's working. No, it's not. It's taking nearly a minute to answer a simple identity request. Therefore, that's not working quite right. So lots of different things all glued together that make the mail system work. Because it's a paid for service, you're exposed. Well, you're not exposed, you're sharing. So any alerts that come out about the service saying, I'm in trouble, things are not quite right, they're not just coming to you, they're going to the customer. So he has visibility of your shortcomings. Unless of course the email server fails. Ah. Maybe not actually, because we do send SMS text as well. So his phone starts to wobble dramatically then. Uh, when he's got the wobbling phone telling him he's got a problem, um, we let them, because we're generous individuals, see the state of the system through Nagios Looking Glass, which is a cl client server application, strips down all the, the information into pretty simple graphics. It's green, it's yellow, it's red. But it does separate the, the viewer from the server, so we can allow people to access that from a wider range of external ports rather than uh, restricting them. And then we use the Nagios graph to catch the performance metrics. Um, network, network throughput and the LDAP response time. LDAP was a real pain in this area. That's what the customer sees. So that's an example set of implemented systems, uh, small, large, ridiculously complicated. And then you get to the joy and the fun that is a data center. What's different about it? It's physical. You've got power, and power comes in a big cable, a cable you can barely get your hands around, and I've got big hands. 
the environment. Things don't work if it gets too wet, if it gets too dry, if it gets too dark in some cases. People can't get in, people can't get out. The wrong people get in, in terms of access, uh, high voltage electricity and people and computers. It's not necessarily a good mix. Um, when I did the original design for this data center and started to talk to people in terms of a communications path to sell them what was gonna happen, I repeatedly had the stress that a data center is a dangerous place. You could quite easily die in there, so don't play. And this system is trying to help you not to die. So, definition. Well, if you're looking for a definition, where to go first, Wikipedia, obviously. It doesn't look like this now, also, obviously, but that's what it looked like when I took the snapshot. It's just a facility used to house computer systems, telecommunication systems, it probably has backup power supplies, probably has redundant data connections. It kind of gives you a, a picture. But all those elements have got to be monitored and reported on. So that's, your, that's why we're doing this. There's a absolutely marvelous document, Data Center Standards Overview, which if I clicked on it, will then take you to the website and show you the 30 odd, 40 odd pages of it, which describes how you define data centers. And they're tiered. So a tier one, it's a server room. It's got walls and a door, and there's equipment in it. That's about as good as it gets. To tier four, it's got all those things, plus dual power supplies, dual generators, dual network connections, and armed guards and razor wire, and some very vicious dogs as well, just to make sure that no one can get in. Well, I mean, the classic with a tier four is that biometric access, you've got to be able to show your eyeball, your palm print, and something else before you can actually open a door to get anywhere close to it. So, with that kind of complexity, obviously there's even more stuff to monitor. You can't read that, but that is the definition of tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four. Now, the major criteria here is the uptime. How long is this thing gonna stay up? So in a tier one, we're expecting about 28 hours of downtime a year. So it can go, it can go down for a whole day, which you know, hopefully is Christmas Day. And then you come down to 22 hours, so tier three, less, then down to 1.6 hours a year. And tier four, when you're really flying, 27 minutes a year of downtime. 27 minutes. It's not normally enough time to turn over in bed and look at your phone and see what the hell the message is. Never mind, fix it. So there's a serious, serious requirement. There's a big leap between it's a server room to this is a proper data center. And we're using Nagios to help us make that leap. And then we get down to the tree hugging. No insult intended. What's a green data center? We have to measure how much power we use to make the data center work. It's a quite simple sum. How much power is coming into the entire building? And how much power are we actually using to run the IT equipment? and you'd like them to be as close to each other as possible so you're not wasting power. Because all that power you're wasting, go away. All that power you're wasting is heating out the world. You know, it's coming out the top of your building and just making little holes in the clouds above you. So there's a thing called the PUE, which is this lovely ca calculation, total facility power divided by You aim, um, if you're stated up, for 1.2. Most data centers up until, let's be arbitrary and say five years ago, were lucky if they got to 1.8. Uh, the data center I designed had a target uh, PUE of 1.6. And we'll get to the point at the moment where you'll say, that's very nice, but how do you prove that? There's another measure that people use for green data centers, which you should steer away from, which is carbon output. How many trees, how much carbon did we put into the world today to make this building? And the thing is that people just look at it in terms of carbon footprint on the power. What you don't allow for is the carbon that was in, in captured or dis released when they actually made the concrete that made the building. So that has to be a number that uh, when you get into it, it's a very, very, very complicated system. So this is, I'd like to say, my data center, but it's not my million and a half pounds. 
<laughs> it was the companies. So, BC1. Uh, built, on, built on an already existing site, which we like to call Brownfield. So the nice thing was, we weren't destroying anybody's green area. We had an office building that was no longer used. Um, so we could tear the inside out and leave the building standing. Design criteria, 1.6 on PUE. Designed so that we could expand it, uh, and it had to be tier three. Um, strangely enough, I work for a commercial organization. If we don't make money, we don't live, and I don't get paid. That's, I, I can't sell data space and use a data center unless it's at least tier three. No one's interested, so. what do you get for 1.2 million pounds? Well, you get a picture. I've got lots of pictures, as it happens. Um, but you get a big room, and then you get some big yellow thing. And that big yellow thing outside that's nearly as big as the room is the generator. Um, so you get a big room, some nice offices, some air conditioning units, but this is what you get. You get, uh, it's, no, it's no fun. You have to specify it, design it, go out to tender, check all the guys are tendering properly, select the provider. Then you get into the exciting thing of trying to get power to your power provider, uh, argue about how much power you can get, where it goes, get planning permission, get building approval, get contract supervision, and you end up with 300 metres square, 300 square metres is a better description, the floor space, 18 kilometres of Cat 6A copper cable, and four kilometres of fibre in just that one room. <laughs> when it expands, I'm going to, well, yes, it's going to be fun. There are places under the floor already where I've got bridges of cable going over other bridges. This is crazy. So, uh, new mains in colour. There was an 11 kilovolt, kilovolt ring going around the, uh, the, the town. We had to take a spur off that. And with the magic of PowerPoint, I had to build my own substation. That's mine. I had to pay for it, I had to design, I had to build it, and then I had to give it to the power company to put, so they could put their package in it. Thank you. Um, 1.2 megawatt generator. That's a big generator. Um, 8,000 litres of fuel, ready and waiting at all times. And the necessary switch, switch gear such that when we lose mains incomer, the generator starts up within 15 seconds. So it's got a big start motor as well. Um, it's great fun. Now, a story to be told here is that, as you can tell, I'm getting on in years. And I've been there before with generators and power supplies. And so I insisted that we'd every month test the generator by the simple empirical method of cutting the mains incomer. You know, little switch, mains incomer off. Does the generator start up? Does it take the load? The first time I tested this switch, I nearly died. It's a tiny little switch, turned it, and about a megawatt of power suddenly went through the air as two knife blades, switches, broke. There's the enormous explosion, all the lights went out, and I thought I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> but sadly, or, well, for, for your benefit, I'm not. I'm here. Um, yes, we worked out that possibly a bit more shielding might be handy because we basically generated our own electronic pulse when we did this. <laughs> And I think a lot of car alarms went off as well. Um, so it's quite interesting, but we've mastered that now. And we do, do still do test every month that the generators will recover from a proper mains incoming failure. We don't trust the switch gear. Uh, three crack units, computer room air conditioning. Um, just big things, big cooling things, but these ones <laughs> use the outside temperature to cool. Now. This particular machine room is at latitude 53 degrees. So there's quite an opportunity to cool stuff outside. And that's what we do. We have cooling, you know, normal compressor, there's normal cooling spirals, which we just stick outside in the cold air, which is usually, uh, averages about nine degrees centigrade, chills it. When we need to actually, in the two weeks, not that I'm being bitter about where this data center is, in the two weeks when the sun shines, and we actually have to put the, the, the coolers on, um, even the cooling cores, we only cool bottom half first. And then only if it gets really hot every 100 years will we turn the top half on. So it's, again, the green thing. We're not wasting power trying to cool stuff that's co totally unnecessary. Um, to be tier three, you have to have more than enough 
So there's n plus one is what it's called. So we need two units to run the data center. We've got three. When we enlarge the data center, we'll end up with four, we end up with five. There'll always be, always be one too many. Um, and we, inside the data center, we run a containment system, which is massively efficient and very, very unpopular with technicians. We take a standard cab, we seal off the front, we seal off the ends, we seal off, and we take cold air from the outside, goes in the front of the cab, blows out the back, up into the ceiling space. So that, that cab, that rear axis, so 20 odd cabs in length, achieves about 38 degrees centigrade, sometimes 40, sometimes 45. It's a great place to work. You really don't want to be there. But it's tremendously efficient because we're not wasting our time cooling air that doesn't need to cool equipment. Uh, if we have a problem with the aircon, because we don't keep the air conditioning units running on a power failure, because the generator will come in and pick those up so they're not UPSed. Whilst we're doing that, that, that joy, the whole of the rest of the machine room has got cold air in it. It's a well of cold air that we can use to keep the equipment cool. Our UPS is, uh, there's one per row of cabinets, and the reason for that is that we can put batteries in there to match the load for that row. So we, know, we haven't lashed out a vast amount of money on a room this size of lead-acid batteries. We just buy them when we need them to support the load. Just smaller side, since this design was made, there's a much more efficient way of cooling exterior air, uh, which involves um, thing called adiabatic cooling, where you just pass the air through a spray of water. You spray the water effectively into a sponge, blow the air through it, as the water expands, sprays out, it cools. Very nice, very efficient. No, no, fluid, no fluids, no um, great um, chemical involvement. Unfortunately, should you do this close to the coast, it's not such a good thing as you're doing the spraying with salt water, and eventually <laughs> that stuff gets in the air that you're pumping around and you get green computers as the air just gently drops the sodium chloride onto bits of copper that you can find. It required to change of filters a bit. But it seemed a good idea at the time. So what are we monitoring? Well, lots. Um, you've got to find some way of taking physical things to digital things. So in this case, I'm using APC devices. Now these guys are just a simple one U box and it takes input from sensors. So this is temperature, humidity, dew point, um, and around the, the air conditioning units on the floor, there's actually a, a rope that detects water. So if we get water egress, we know that's happening as well. But that, then that's, that's a quite simple thing. That's just a sensor. It's a sensor that picks up and sends us a number. However, for really big boxes, the generator, you know, something that can't be moved without an enormous crane, they tend not to have very many digital interfaces. What they tend to have, because of their engineering background, are voltage interfaces. They just go open, close. And it means something. What it means is up to you. So we use a, uh, a seal box that actually does the voltage. We see that sees the voltage flip. It then generates a link back to the netbots. So if you've got equipment that just has voltage outputs, which is extremely common in the engineering industry, you can still monitor them for situations. We were talking earlier about PUE and efficiency. So we also have to find some way of measuring what's going on. Very old statement, if you can't measure it, you don't know what's happening. So we have uh, software, so hardware meters on every input into the system. So there's one on that big cable, there's a big meter. There's another one that's on each distribution unit that goes to each uh, row of cabs. There's one that goes to the house supply that, that powers the lift to the lights. So we actually, in each one of those meters, reports back in real time the current utilization. So we actually have a very pretty picture telling us what our PUE is at any instant in time. It's not a very pretty picture because it's not at the design point yet, but it'll get better. Each PDU strip in the back of a cab, we normally have a long strip with loads of sockets in that you plug equipment into. Well, we have two per cab and they're monitored. They're alive 
they know how much power is coming out of each socket. They tell everybody, well, not everybody, tell me, how much power is being consumed. And there are two reasons for that. One is you need to know if you're overloading a strip, because it can only take 32 amps in each side, so you want to know if someone's pulling more. The other is, I'll hop back to this again, we're a commercial organisation. We quite like to know how much power people are taking because we quite like to charge them. Some of the PDU strips are also down to remote control, so you've got socket level. So if someone's remote and says, that, that is really, 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 really badly crashed, and I haven't got DRAC or any other system of getting into the back of the thing to turn it on and off, I can turn it on and off at the wall. So if I've got an appliance that has no remote lights out facility, I can turn it actually on and off at the wall. All this stuff is generating information, and it's quite interesting information, and it's quite powerful information. So there's a, a completely physically separate management network that is part of the monitoring system. You don't really want to publish on the internet ways of turning things on and off. I'd really rather not. So there's a completely separate LAN, and that of course means that there's a completely separate LAN infrastructure and completely separate servers. So all of that's got to be kind of managed, kind of watched, and used. So, a few slides. What do, they, what do they look like? Well, they look a bit like this. So, this is netbots. This is taking sensor information uh, and trapping it out and saying, look, this is things that right. And down the, your left-hand side, you can see humidity and temperature. And the second one down is the interesting one. It says beacon. Beacon is a big mother of a flashing light that is mounted over the door that, that when you enter the machine room. If the system says there's an environmental problem, that beacon starts to flash. And at that point, no one goes in. Everybody comes out, no one's allowed in until the proper trained and supervised person decides what to do about it. One of the things that we'll see in the next slide, which is what the cellular looks like, it's, it's monitoring the extinguishing system. A thing called FN200. We've uh, nice moved on, actually extinguishing, slight diversion. When I was young, which seems a long time ago, it was CO2. And that meant that when a CO2 dump went off in your machine room, you ran for the door, you had 30 seconds to live, and while you were doing it, it looked like saving Private Ryan because floor tiles were going past your ears as the gas blew out at such a pressure. And it then went misty because it condensed. So you can't see what's going on, you've got floor tiles going past your ear, and you know you've got 30 seconds to get out the door. In my case, I was also shouting to the shift supervisor, put the mask on, I'm out of here. Because we actually had oxygen tanks and masks by the door. So, so we got past that, and then we went on to other things like Halon, which is great. Still couldn't breathe it, you had longer to live, but then it turns out unfortunate side effects with the ozone layer. Like it's you know, whole the size of South America if you dumped it all at once. So, so now we use FM200. You can breathe this, um, and it comes out at a really low pressure which is nice, Gent gently sealing floods, which is, which is excellent. Although I have seen one installation which actually put it in a high pressure. It came out at 14 atmospheres and blew the windows out. <laughs> so you used to, these days, you used to have pressure relief vents down, down the floor, so you have a set of louvers, and they just go as it dumps, because otherwise, it, yeah. very unpleasant, very, very unpleasant. This is the electricity stuff. It's just a representation, but you can see that we're running a low. We've got a PU calculation. There's even a carbon usage. Not that you'd believe that number. Um, but it just basically shows the electrical, electrical circuitry, and then each of the little green icons is actually the, the, the monitor. Now if I click on this, you can see what a monitor looks like. So it's just a little lump. Uh, that's measuring in that particular panel, that's the house panel, and at that point we're chewing 22 kilowatts in the house, which is not bad. Not necessarily good, not bad. Now, yes. when we were building this data centre, it came as quite an interesting surprise to me that we would put this monitoring system in and we were calibrating it. Uh, no one else in the building, just three guys, some guys in day glow shirts putting cables together. And um, one of them went to the toilet, put the hand dryer on, and the electricity load went up by 5%. 
It was something like a three kilowatt hand dryer. Strangely enough, that came out. because <laughs> That makes your numbers look ridiculous. But until you've got this kind of metering to see what's happening, you don't know. You really don't. I'm going to kill us a bit. Metered PDU, again, it's just simple, green and red, what we're consuming, are we in the yellows, are we in the reds, what are we pulling? Um, we're quite happy to see that. We know what's being pulled. What we don't want is um, madmen sticking big plugs in and then adapters off the end of the plugs and then foregoing adapters off the end of those plugs. Um, and this will stop that with the controlled um, systems, of course, they could plug it in anywhere, we don't care, because it won't be turned on. Yep. Managed PDU, just the same, except you'll see from the logs that uh, we turned an outlet on. So a proper change control has flown through the system that says someone's installing equipment, they need two power supplies. At the time they come in with their change control, we'll turn on two sockets, tell the fitter which two sockets he's allowed to use, plugs it in and he gets power. One of the things about this is that it allows you to monitor the power. It also keeps you in full control of the power. Um, we have to, we've had accidents, before, well not accidents, but accidents waiting to happen where people have put different phases into the same cabinet. Now, data center is a dangerous place. In the UK, where we're providing 220 volts at 32 amps, that's quite a lot of power. When you get it really wrong and provide the same power at a different phase, you have generated a potential of over 420 volts across the sides of the cab. Grabbing a hold of them, not a good thing to do, because you will die. Um, and the lights will go out. Um, so it's all this sort of thing, this magic. It's not just performance. It's not just charging. It's also safety. I'll put this in there. It's always been a bugbear of mine that Nagios map is about as much use as a chocolate teapot. But in this case, it's just using the system to say where we put PDUs. Each PDU is taking a network port. So therefore, it has to go on our management land. But by using the parent technology, we can actually say we can stop a million things going wrong when someone, when a switch crashes and we get told that 22 PDUs have gone offline. So, just to illustrate, we're actually using that facility. I've grouped stuff in a particular way. Um, it's not an accident. It's just my way of doing things. So, the air conditioning, the network firewalls, the PDUs, all grouped in a particular way. So in this, it just so happens that that matches the config file names in the config subdirectory, so it kind of relates. So I'm still a, a command line editing type of guy, and so there'll be a file called pdus.config, uh, which kind of maps to this host grouping. So everybody knows where to go. Yeah, we like this one. Do things go wrong? Well, yes, they do. Uh, this is a real going wrong slide. Um, what we see here is that an air conditioning unit has gone critical. Now, we found this by scanning the SNMP traps. And the way we collect them is, yes, we put them into an SNMP trap, we put them into event DB, and we wander up and down event DB looking for particular messages. Uh, and then we need to find a number of these messages. The nice, nice thing about the non-determinism of trapping is that the event might be over by the time the trap arrives. It's just life. Um, so you want to wait a while and see, correlate these things. Did, did, did everything happen? Did it happen? Is it still happening? After we've seen enough of those, then we start telling people it's broken. Um, three people get told. The operators, your ops, um, Someone called Phil Reed, who you'll be unsurprised to learn is the operations manager, and some other person called SMSOM. Well, the ops and Phil Reed get an email. So we kind of hope that during most of the working shift, the ops will be standing there going, why is it all gone red, and sort it out. Just in case, we email their manager to make sure. And just in case it's in the middle of the night and no one's awake, 
we make sure that we text the SMS OM, which is the phone that's held by the on-call manager. So even if, even if email's away and asleep, then someone still knows that there's a serious problem occurring. Excuse me, Dave. Um, we'll have to probably wrap up in just another minute or two to make a little bit yep. of transition time for the next. So I just wanted to no. give a little heads up. No problems. This is a, does it go wrong? Yes and no. This is like, oh my God, the whole world's gone, falling apart. And the answer is, uh, no, it hasn't. What fell apart here was someone didn't put a change control in requesting scheduled downtime. So if someone's changing one of those LAN switches on the network for another, replacing it, and uh, lo and behold, everything lit up. If they'd actually put a change control and said, can I have scheduled downtime, we wouldn't have had that problem. The monitoring schematic is a scary thing. It's about how we show the information to everybody and how we separate out the functions. So there's a display server, there's a logging server, um, and there's a backup server. If you actually make your organization dependent on this kind of service, then it best be there. Quick list of the products are in use. Yes, I think I've picked them all. Core, Looking Glass, Nagvis, EventDB, SMTT, Nagmap, and NDO. Other things in use? Neddy, Artwatch, Pisa, they're, they're all there, um, all doing things, um, all welded together to do things. That's a split of how we've actually decided to split stuff down. Display, custom systems, backup system. What does it look like? It looks like that. A <laughs> um, couple of 42-inch plasmas, five LCD screens mounted on back, and the rest of the screens are operators' consoles. So that's what they see every day of their lives. <laughs> well, that's what it should be seeing. Um, a display system that um, drives the, uh, the two big screens. And the normal display system is just a little box that happens to be able to drive five consoles at once. A very interesting X setup when you try and do that. Then there's the customer. This is the appliance. This is our version of Nagios appliance. It's a motion tablet device running for various reasons, Ubuntu. Um, and that's what we give to a customer. We say, this is what's going to monitor your systems and help us manage your problems. Backup system using Backkiller. Uh, just stress there that if you make people dependent on your monitoring systems, you ought to have a backup of them. Right, last three slides. Right, so did you ever know what you're go going to monitor? At least have an idea about what it is that you're interested in. Is it the kit? Is it the application? Is it the business function? Is it the fact that the lights are on? Find out who needs to be told. This is an organisational and human nightmare. Who's going to put their hand up and be told that this is a problem? As in Raymond Brooks' Mythical Man Month, expect to throw the first one away. When you build something like this, because you will anyway, you'll get three quarters of the way, all the way through, and then go, oh, I could have done it better. So you will. You've got to make it pretty. You have to accept that an attractive display of some nature will be required. And it's got to be reliable. Hints. Um, our experience has been separate your display systems from your monitoring systems. I've got, a, I've got a system that generates an untold amount of SNMP traps. It's a, it's a public switch exchange. Lifting up the handset to go off hook generates a trap. That's a lot of traffic and you've got 20,000 extensions. Escalation and alerting takes time. Getting it right to escalate and alert to the right person at the right time is good. If you're like me and use things like SMS client, it actually physically takes a long time. Suppliers, and I'm you know, in that, in that uh, camp, will go out of their way to make it hard for you to integrate. Dave, I, I, I apologize. I know you're almost at the end, but I think we should probably wrap okay. it up pretty yep. quickly to allow people to come in and, and leave for the next session if they're going to a different track. So I apologize that I don't want to have it yep. come to an end, but if you could wrap up quickly. No problem. SNMP is your friend. The reason I put that in there is that 
I've had numerous difficulties with people objecting to the security of SNMP, and SNMP v3 with AIS ciphers is a good thing and is supported. And then you get there. Wrapped up. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you again. If anybody has questions for Dave, um, maybe you could just uh, take them off to the side. Our next speaker um, is going to be David Thomas in this room, in this track. He's going to be talking about um, uh, knowing about problems before your customers do, which is always a, a really good thing. Um, there are two other tracks going on in other rooms, uh, tracks two and tracks three, so check your schedule, see what you're interested in. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>